Hi friends, it's Kate here for my January reading wrap up. And January was a really excellent reading month. Uh, I think, you know, me taking a uh, fast from uh, taking a break from social media really helped that. And I ended up reading, is it 13? 15. Oh, 15 books in, um, or I guess technically 17. Oh my goodness. See what happens when I don't spend time on social media. Uh, so it was just a really good revamp for me of just focusing when I'm actually reading. Uh, I'm not opposed to doing social media. I just don't like that I get so distracted by it when I'm not wanting to be distracted. So I will just launch into the books then because I have a lot to talk about. And the very first book that I finished uh, was an audiobook of Waistcoats and Weaponry by Gail Carriger. This is the third in her Finishing School series, and it was a really wonderful addition to the series. And I liked that it was uh, kind of a departure from the typical school year and like the typical way that it ended. There were some cliffhangers. There were things that were making me, um, questions that I had and, uh, just different aspects of it that I could not wait. I can't wait to pick up the next one to see kind of how things have, uh, continued to go through the, through the series, but it's just a very fun series and a big pick me up and it's just incredibly fun and engaging. So I definitely recommend this series if you're looking for a fun YA kind of steampunk type series. Um, and it, yeah, so since it's steampunk, it's fun because it has some fantasy elements, but it's set during the Victorian era and it's a lot of fun. Then I completed another Agatha Raisin mystery, and that was Agatha Raisin and the Fairies of Friam. In this one, Agatha travels to a little village and, um, she can tell their the locals are being somewhat secretive and uh she sees these little fairy lights on in her backyard but to investigate she can't find them anymore um and the locals are just being incredibly evasive uh and of course you know it's an agatha raisin there's going to be a murder that happens and one of Agatha's friends shows up to keep her company while she's there and they investigate the murder together and of course there's stuff happening in Agatha's personal life. And these books just always do exactly what I want them to do. I always have the exact experience I'm hoping to have with them. So that was the 10th in that series. And I definitely plan to uh, continue reading. So I am hoping to get to the Christmas one by Christmas time. So I do want to keep making sure, making an effort that I'm reading Agatha Raisin. Uh, and it's a series I really enjoy. And one of the ones that I listed I wanted to finish. So I will keep doing that. Uh, next on the list is The Path of Daggers by Robert Jordan. Uh, I think I started this in November. I think I did. And then I got sidetracked in December by Christmassy Reads and Cloak and Dagger Christmas. But I finished it in November. I mean, I finished it this month in January. And I am so happy to be picking up this series again. I had taken a break, I think, for about a year from it. And it's just really wonderful that Doris was interested in reading the series and was right around the same point in the series that I was. Uh, so it's just, there's something really special about continuing on with a high fantasy series that has a length like this, I feel that you do really get quite an in-depth knowledge of characters that you can't get in a standalone novel necessarily. And it's just really an excellent way to get to know characters one chunker, chunky book at a time. Yeah, I, I love this series, uh, the Wheel of Time series. And this was book eight. So Doris and I are over halfway because there are 14 books in the series. So I'm definitely making progress through that. But I feel that BookTube has really documented my progress through that series because I started my first one my second month on BookTube. So it's really nice to have that documented. Maybe I should do um, a little like video with, with me talking about each one, you know, at the end. I don't know. We'll see. 
Okay, then a really special book that I read. Um, so for those of you who remember, I um, I have my international calendar or like my world map calendar uh, reading project where I read a book from each country uh, that you know happens each month. And so January's was Germany, and so I read All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric. This is so bad. I just have the name like in front of me, but since it's a German name, Eric Maria Remark. I'm not sure how to say that since it's German. Uh, but it was an amazing book. It was poignant. It was not at all fun to read, but obviously, but you know, you know, every read doesn't have to be a fun read. It was a very important one. I was really surprised at how beautifully it was written because it was talking about such gruesome things. It's life on the front lines from this soldier and you're just hearing everything from his perspective up close and personal. So I do have one passage to read just as an example of how it really show kind of the significance of every single event. Um, it says, the evening benediction begins. Night comes, out of the craters rise the mists. It looks as though the holes were full of ghostly secrets. The white vapor creeps painfully round before it ventures to steal away over the edge. Then long streaks stretch from crater to crater. It is chilly. I am on sentry and stare into the darkness. My strength is exhausted as always after an attack and so it is hard for me to be alone with my thoughts. They are not properly thoughts. They are memories, which in my weakness haunt me and strangely move me. The parachute lights soar upwards, and I see a picture, a summer evening. I am in the cathedral cloister and look at the tall rose trees that bloom in the middle of the little cloister garden where the monks lie buried. Around the walls are the stone carvings of the Stations of the Cross. No one is there. A great quietness rules in this blossoming quadrangle, the sun lies warm on the heavy gray stones. I place my hand upon them and fill the warmth. At the right-hand corner, the green cathedral spi spire ascends into the pale blue sky of the evening. Between the glowing columns of the cloister is the cool darkness that only churches have, and I stand there and wonder whether, when I am twenty, I shall have experienced the bewildering emotions of love. The image is alarmingly near. It touches me before it dissolves in the light of the next star shell. I lay hold of my rifle to see that it is in trim. The barrel is wet. I take it in my hands and rub off the moisture with my fingers. Between the meadows behind our town, there stands a line of old poplars by a stream. They were visible from a great distance, and although they grew on one bank only, we called them the Poplar Avenue. Even as children, we had a great love for them. They drew us vaguely thither. We played truant the whole day by them and listened to their rustling. We sat beneath them on the bank of the stream and let our feet hang in the bright, swift waters. The pure fragrance of the water and the melody of the wind in the poplars held our fancies. We loved them dearly, and the image of those days still makes my heart pause in its beating. It is strange that all the memories that have come have these two qualities. They are always completely calm. That is predominant in them. And even if they are not really calm, they become so. They are soundless apparitions that speak to me with looks and gestures silently, without any word, and it is the alarm of their silence that forces me to lay hold of my, of my sleeve and my rifle, lest I should abandon myself to the liberation and allurement in which my body would dilate and gently pass away into the still forces that lie behind these things. They are quiet in this way, because quietness is so unattainable for us now. At the front, there is no quietness, and the curse of the front reaches so far that we never pass beyond it. Even in the remote depots and rest areas, the droning and the muffled noise of shelling is always in our ears. We are never so far off that it is no more to be heard. But these last few days, it has been unbearable. Their stillness is the reason why these memories of former times do not awaken desire so much as sorrow, a vast, inapprehensible melancholy. Once we had such desires, but they return not. They are past. They belong to another world that is gone from us. In the barracks, they called forth a rebellious, wild craving for their return. For then they were still bound to us. We belonged to them and they to us, even though they were already absent from them. They appeared in the soldiers' songs, which we sang as we marched between the glow of the dawn and the black silhouettes of the forest to drill on the moor. They were a powerful remembrance that was in us and came from us. But here in the trenches, they are completely lost to us. 
They arise no more. We are dead, and they stand remote on the horizon. They are a mysterious reflection, an apparition that haunts us, that we fear and love without hope. They are strong, and our desire is strong, but they are unattainable, and we know it. And even if these scenes of our youth were given back to us, we would hardly know what to do. The tender secret influence that passed from them into us could not rise again. We might be amongst them and move in them. We might remember and love them and be stirred by the sight of them, but it would be like gazing at the photograph of a dead comrade. Those are his features. It is his face, and the days we spent together take on a mournful life in the memory. But the man himself, it is not. We can never regain the old intimacy with those scenes. It was not any recognition of their beauty and their significance that attracted us, but the communion, the feeling of a comradeship with the things and events of our existence, which cut us off and made the world of our parents a thing incomprehensible to us. For then we surrendered ourselves to events and were lost in them. And the least little thing was enough to carry us down the stream of eternity. Perhaps it was only the privilege of our youth, but as yet we recognized no limits and saw nowhere an end. We had that thrill of expectation in the blood which unites us with the course of our days. Today we would pass through the scenes of our youth like travelers. We are burnt up by hard facts, like tradesmen. We understand distinctions, and like butchers, necessities. We are no longer untroubled. We are indifferent. We might exist there, but should we really live there? We are forlorn like children, and experienced like old men, who are crude and sorrowful and superficial. I believe we are lost." So an incredibly poignant, moving, heartbreaking read. And um, honestly, the portion of the book that was the most heartbreaking to me was when he was home on leave and he didn't know what to do with himself. He didn't know how to process kind of visiting his home where his past self had lived and now his you know, current in the current state that he was in visiting, kind of processing the person that he used to be with the person that he was now and just the pain of being there for a little while, but then knowing he had to go back. So I'm very glad that I read it. It was a very important read and, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, it will stay with me for a long time. Then I read, um, for the reading through the ages, um, project that Mel and, uh, Victoria, are hosting this year, which is so much fun. I read The Witch of Blackbird Pond by Elizabeth George Spear. This is for one of the America's early settlement uh, books that I read. And I have a review of this coming out, so I will share my thoughts in that review. I will save my thoughts for that. The study read I did with Kate from the novel Nomad was Sydney Chambers and The Perils of Night. This is the second book in the uh, Sydney Chambers series. And I just adore these books so much. There's something really special and unique about them. So much more special than the TV series. Just don't get me started. There is something really special about James Runcie's writing style in these. That at the same time, they're really poignant and so deep and have so much to say, but they are so readable. I don't feel intimidated as I'm reading them. This is just, I think, a really special detective series. So in case you don't know, this is the second in the Grandchester Mysteries, where uh, Sydney Chambers is a vicar in a small town of Grandchester. Wow. In the small town of Grandchester, and he ends up becoming really good friends with one of the police chiefs, Jordy Keating, and helps him investigate things in the first book. And then that continues in the second book. What I really enjoy about these is that there's lots, while there's lots of like personal life happenings, it doesn't feel overwhelming and it, you still feel like you're getting these cases. This is also a really unique series in that he does the cases, they're sort of little novelettes. There's six chapters to this, and there's a different mystery in each of those. Um, it's a really special series. I'm really glad Kate suggested we pick this one up in the month of January, and I look forward to picking up the next in the series. Next on the list was No Name by Wilkie Collins. Uh, this is one of my um, October top five, you know, five star TBR books and I um decided this year I'll just talk about them as I read them but then still make a video uh with all of them in there. Um and uh, I did not like this. 
I started out incredibly hopeful. I don't know for those of you who watch the Talking Amongst Ourselves live show that I participate in with two friends. Um, I was I was telling them that I was really excited about this. It started off. Um, we have two sisters and I really loved their different personalities. And then I loved the personalities of the parents. And it just seemed like it was going to be a sensation novel that had character development. Um, so we basically are following these two sisters um, through the course of the novel, seeing how they handle different events that happen. But in reality, we end up following one of the sisters more. We get a lot more of her. And if we had gotten a lot more of the other sister, I would have really enjoyed this book. But it just got monotonous. And I got really inv invested in certain aspects of the plot. And then I felt like I'd kind of been manipulated. And I don't know why we spent so much time doing that if, you know, X, Y, and Z is going to happen then. So... Unfortunately, this only got two stars for me. The writing was was good, the prose. Um, I think Wilkie Collins is a great writer, but unfortunately, another miss for me. So I do have this fear, you know, when I when I say I want to read a uh, complete Victorian author, like maybe there's a reason their other books aren't as famous and maybe I won't like any of his other books, but I am still going to try. Um, it's just, it makes me wonder if I will love any other ones as much as The Woman in White. And not that I have to love them as much, but I want to love uh, other books because, you know, I spent 600 pages reading this and it didn't feel worth it in the end. If this had been condensed to 300 pages, I could have maybe gotten behind it, but it just felt like I invested an awful lot of time in it for not much reward. I will say, though, I think if you liked Armadale, you will like this. I think there was about the same amount of character development as there was in Armadale. So like I said, it just followed the other sister. And I think I would have liked this book a lot more if it had followed the sister that I wanted to know about. So, disappointing in the end, unfortunately. A book that I read with my Peter, um, and it was really a delight. It was really fun was The Rescuers by Marjorie Sharp. I remember years ago, my sister-in-law telling me about this book and saying, you know, you know, the Disney movie that's based on a real book series and uh, being so surprised. I had this month tried a adult novel by Marjorie Sharp, but it had jogged my brain. Oh yeah, she writes The Rescuers series. And so I picked this up at the library. This is a different plot. Um, it's not even the same plot as the first movie that came out in the 70s. This, um, the movie that came out in the 70s is based on, I think, the second one in the series. Um, but this involves B Miss Bianca and Bernard meeting uh, for the first time. And they go to rescue a prisoner uh, who's stuck in uh, the bottom of a castle in Poland. I think it's in Poland. Norway. Wow. Um, he's stuck in Norway. They also have another guide going with them. So it was a really charming read. Um, I will say, I think if I had been a kid, I might have enjoyed it a little bit more. I didn't feel, the characters felt very aloof. Um, but it was really fun to read aloud. So I think reading it to Peter was what made it so fun for me. But it got three stars out of me. So it was like a solid children's book for me. Um, but I will show you briefly the illustrations for this. So Garth Williams was the one who did the illustrations and they were just fabulous. Um, there we go. This is all of them sitting in, um, in a pipe having a meeting. So yeah, very charming. And I kind of, it was, it was as like classic feeling as I was hoping it to as my expectations had. And I do recommend it. Next on the list uh, is Lord Edgeware Dies by Agatha Christie. This was a, yeah, it was good one. Uh, it, it didn't get, you know, much enthusiasm out of me. Um, I do find when I read Agatha Christie, unfortunately, I'm often very excited at the beginning. And then at the end, I'm like, yeah, it was good. So that's how I felt. Solid three stars. Next, I have a book that I was really surprised by how much I enjoyed it, and it was Miracle on Maple Miracles on Maple Hill by Virginia Sorensen. 
I had a friend recommend this. She had talked about it on her bookstagram and it is, um, it's a really wonderful book. I now, um, you know, reading the witch of blackbird pond and this one, um, it's put me on a Newberry kick and I want to definitely keep, keep reading. Um, I want to keep reading more, more Newberry books. So this is about Marley and her family. She has a brother, uh, Joe, and then her parents and her father has come back from fighting, uh, in during world war two. And he has PTSD and they live in the city and it's crowded and he's just having a really hard time coping um, afterwards. So they decide to go where Marley's mom used to spend her summers uh, to Maple Hill, where her grandparents used to live. And um, it ends up just being this glorious time. There were so many Kate boxes that were ticked. You know, they go off to the countryside. They find the countryside to be this amazing place of healing. And you just get to hear about all of the beautiful wildlife and all of the animals that live around. There are very kind and warm hearted neighbors who live nearby. Uh, there are some funny bits and it was just a really fun, fun book. And, um, neat to see this family really healed through this time. And the one thing that the one reason I didn't give it five stars is I listened to the audiobook of this. It was a really wonderful cast narration. But whenever the protagonist Marley was really uh, upset, um, <clears throat> she her whiny voice really grated on me and she got upset a fair amount. Uh, and in one instance, she super annoyed me. She, when they find the house on Maple Hill, they're going to live in, they find there's a mouse family living there and she gets really upset and distraught that her parents, for some reason, don't want to let this mouse family live with them. I think this really struck a nerve with me because we battle against mice every fall then they go away. So um, it's okay. You know, we haven't seen one for a while, but it just really, you know, mice are dirty. You don't want to live with them and that she acts like such a murder about it. Um, yeah. So that's the only reason it didn't give me five stars that I didn't give it five stars. Uh, Cause Marley plus her name just annoyed me too. So yeah, that would have made it five stars if there hadn't been those aspects that bothered me. But anyhow, still very, very enjoyable. Then another book that I read for the Reading Through the Ages challenge was Shinju by Laura Jo Rowland. And that review, um, and that was for the Japan Before 1800 challenge. So that review will be coming up shortly too. Um, it's all filmed and edited and scheduled. So it, it is actually coming out. Uh, then another one that I read for Reading Through the Ages, um, this was another audiobook that I did. It was is The Sign of the Beaver uh, by Elizabeth George Spear. So that was another one I read for the America's Early Settlement period. And so that's a dual book review coming out with, along with The Witch of Blackbird Pond. So I look forward to everyone, you know, hearing my thoughts on those. Uh, then a book that I finally finished, this is ridiculous, was Nine Coaches Waiting by Mary Stewart. I left this at my parents' house at Christmas time because it was the December pick for the Mary Stewart ladies. It was a reread for me. And um, then it got left at my parents for a couple weeks. And I started like a kajillion other books in the meantime when it got back. So then I just finished it two days ago. Anyhow, that being said, I really enjoyed rereading this. There were some things I had forgotten. I was surprised. And I'm actually surprised to say I think it's second place now um, after this rough magic. That's not to say that I didn't enjoy it. That's just saying how much I really loved this rough magic. But I'm really glad that I reread it. And um, I'll definitely be rereading other Mary Stewart books in future. So it's really nice to own them. So just anytime I feel like it, I can pick one up. And a buddy read with uh, Kate from the novel Nomad, our second mystery buddy read of the month. And my pick was The Vault by Ruth Rendell. So... As far as a Wexford book goes, this was middling. It was like a fine one. It was adequate. I gave it three stars. However, this was a sequel to a standalone book that Kate and I read together um, two years ago called A Sight for Sore Eyes. 
that was a, like a psychological horror. And um, these bodies are found in a house over a decade later. And you see the whole murder happen. You see how the bodies get there. You see the whole workings of the scheme. And it was such um, a really uh, like visceral and like gross reading experience for me. But it was amazing too. the tension building. It was especially stressful to read because the police are not there at any point, And it just felt so chaotic. I kept being like, where are the police? They need to know this is happening. Um, so it was an amazing book, but I still don't know if I want to reread it because it was so intense. It's not that this was, you know, awful or anything. I think it just really didn't stand up to, um, the reading experience that Kate and I both had in a site for sore eyes. So I think we both felt kind of a little underwhelmed. So it was also going to be, I thought, kind of impossible for Wexford to figure it out. But then it was like, all of a sudden he did. It felt really exciting. But the whole time, you know, while he's investing and trying to find this one person who's the key to the case. Um, and then it just happens. He figures it out. And it didn't feel nearly as exciting as I had built it up to be. So yeah, three stars. Um, the penultimate Wexford. So I am glad kind of on that note, that isn't the last Wexford. Um, so yes. Uh, then a really lovely, lovely two books that I read were Betsy Tacey, Betsy Tacey and Tib. Uh, this is the, these are the first two in the um, year long read along of the series that I and Katie from Life Between Words and Kelly from Books I'm Not Reading are hosting. And I really do hope you'll join us. There is still time and I will link my um, review video of the first two books up down below. And then if you would like, you can join us in February for Betsy and Tacey Go Over the Big Hill and Betsy and Tacey Go Downtown, which I do hope you will join us. Uh, then I read Wives and Daughters again. You know, like you do. It, it was my third time reading it. Basically, the podcast Bonnets at Dawn was hosting a read along. And I was like, all right, yes, I'm joining this. Um, so it's just been lovely, delightful revisiting this story again, getting to hear about these beloved characters. I love this book so much. I've talked on and on about it. And I'm really excited now that since it's so fresh in my mind, um, I will have it that fresh in my mind for the discussion episodes. I think they have two discussion episodes about wives and daughters coming out. So that made me very excited and motivated. Uh, then just a little snippet, a little segment of a book that I read was the January portion of Meadowland. I decided when um, I was looking at this, thinking about starting it at the very end of December, and I realized there was a chapter per month. Why not just read each chapter each month? So yesterday I sat down and I read the January chapter and it was delightful. I'm so glad that I did. I'm really looking forward to continuing on with this in the year. And he has each month, um, it's very special. He has a different plant or animal um, or bird um, that he focuses on for the month. So it was a meadow pipit was the first one. So then it was neat. I got to, you know, look up a video and listen to the, the call of the pipit. Um, yeah, I'm really, I, I enjoyed the first chapter. It did feel... I didn't feel totally enraptured by it, basically. So I'm hoping to continue maybe in February, be really totally in love with it. Those were my January reads. Thank you for watching. Thank you for coming back and supporting my channel through breaks and whatnot. And I will uh, be back for review videos soon. I will be back soon and have a lovely rest of your day.